Hyakujo's fox. Once, when Hyakujo delivered some Zen lectures, an old man attended them unseen by the other monks. At the end of each talk, when the monks left, so did he. But one day he remained after they had gone, and Hyakujo asked him, who are you? The old man replied, I am not a human being, but I was one when the Kashapa Buddha preached in this world. I was a Zen master and lived on this mountain. At that time, one of my students asked me whether or not the enlightened person is subject to the law of causation. I answered him, the enlightened person is not subject to the law. For this answer evidencing a clinging to absoluteness, I became a fox for 500 rebirths, and I am still a fox. Will you save me from this condition with your Zen words and let me get out of the fox's body? Now may I ask you, is the enlightened person subject to the law of causation? Hyakujo said, the enlightened person is the one with the law of causation. At the words of Hyakujo, the old man was enlightened. I am emancipated, he said, paying homage with a deep bow. I am no more a fox, but I have to leave my body in my dwelling place behind this mountain. Please perform my funeral as a monk. Then he disappeared. The next day, Hyakujo gave an order through the chief monk to prepare to attend the funeral of a monk. No one was sick in the infirmary, wondered the monks. What does our teacher mean? After dinner, Hyakujo led the monks out and around the mountain. In a cave with his staff, he poked out the body of an old fox and then performed the ceremony of cremation. That evening, Hyakujo gave a talk to the monks and told them this story. Obaku, upon hearing the story, asked Hyakujo, I understand that a long time ago, because a certain person gave a wrong answer, he became a fox for 500 rebirths. Now, I want to ask, if some modern master is asked many questions and he always gives the right answer, what will become of him? Hyakujo said, come here near me and I will tell you. Obaku went near Hyakujo and slapped the teacher's face with his hand for he knew this was the answer his teacher intended to give him. Hyakujo clapped his hands and laughed at his discernment. Controlled or not controlled, the same dice shows two faces, not controlled or controlled. Both are in error. Please breathe in with me and out. I invite you now to get comfortable in your seat. Close your eyes or not. And simply breathe. Nothing to do here, nothing to fix. Simply be and start to notice what does that mean, simply being? We ask, who am I? 
what am I? It's hard to see, isn't it? Instead, perhaps, however you wish, ask, what is I? Feel your body sitting in the pew. Is that I? Remember the color of your skin, your size, your shape. Is that I? The breaths that you are breathing in and out. Are those I? The thoughts that are filling your head right now. Are those I? the emotions in your heart, in your gut. Are those I? And as you scan deeper within yourself, Gently noticing all that is there, like waves coming in and out from the shore. Is any of it I? Maybe as you watch, you will notice an emptying or a thinning. Those thoughts become lighter. The body that you inhabit feels less attached. Until what you notice is that ocean, those waves themselves, washing in and out, and a vast sky above. That we are all connected to, that connects all of us together in a web. Is that I?
And as we come back into this room, onto our chairs, our benches, our pews, we can take some of that openness, that oceanic wash, where I is not so important anymore, and balance it with the lives that we live in our bodies and our minds and in our hearts today. And when you're ready, take a breath and open your eyes. Song of Myself. I celebrate myself and sing myself and what I assume you shall assume. For every atom belonging to me as good belongs to you. I loaf and invite my soul. I lean and loaf at my ease, observing a spear of summer grass. My tongue, every atom of my blood formed from this soil, this air, born here of parents born here, from parents the same, and their parents the same. I, now 37 years old, in perfect health begin, hoping to cease not till death. Creeds and schools in abeyance, retiring back a while, sufficed at what they are, but never forgotten. I harbor for good or bad, I permit to speak at every hazard. Nature without check, with original energy. A few months back, when Kent asked me to do this, sorry, um, I said, sure, uh, give me some parameters. What's the theme for the month that can work with that? He said, ah, oh, it's resilience, resilience. I said, all right, resilience, got it. Um, about a week later, I went to the USG website, to the small group ministry uh, space where uh, there's a lot of information about each monthly theme. And sure enough, the theme for July was resistance. And I thought, huh, what an interesting slip of the tongue. That's cool, because um, I think there are a lot of, um, there's a fine relationship between resilience and, and resistance that um, gives us a lot of fertile ground to explore and talk about. Uh, one very popular uh, researcher out there now uh, who talks about a lot of things like these themes is a woman named Brene Brown. Who's heard of Brene Brown? Okay, <laughs> great. Um, yeah, for those of you who don't know, she's a, a researcher and social worker based at the University of Houston. Uh, she's written numerous books and has spent about the past 20, 25 years studying uh, the things that in humanity are hard to define, like um, empathy and vulnerability and resilience and um, uh, looking at, at, at how they affect our, our, our everyday lives and how they affect things like leadership and government and families and parenting. Um, her book, Rising Strong, uh, describes her research on courage and resilience. She interviewed and surveyed thousands of people, and this is really fascinating. She found that the most resilient people have one thing only in common, and that is 
a regular spiritual practice. Which brings up two really great questions that I'm sure we can answer in 15 minutes. What is spirituality? And what is practice? Now, Brene Brown found a huge variety of personal definitions of uh, spiritual practices and beliefs, and they all kind of distill down to this. A feeling of deep connection to something that is bigger than you and that is rooted in a sense of love and a greater good. Those, that, that sense combined seems to produce a kind of generosity of spirit that becomes a generative energy from which resilience is born. Now, people's sense of the spiritual go by, goes by many names. For some people, it's a walk in the woods. For others, it's marveling at their baby's first steps. Some people call their spirituality God or goddess. Some call it Allah. Buddhists call it Chi. Hindus, Prana. Interestingly, these last three references to spirit or God um, all deal with the breath. Uh, in fact, the, word, the name Allah literally translates to the wow. The breath that inspires and breathes life into all things. She is the same, the breath that gives life to everything. Prana, same thing. One night a while back, I was playing music with my friend Raji, who's a guitarist, and we were wrapping up, and I said, man, sometimes I feel like music is my religion. And he said, yeah, I don't know if it's my religion, but it's definitely my prayer. There may be as many forms of spiritual practice as there are people, but it is kind of remarkable how many people find a connection to spirituality through creativity. Now, creativity, art making, self-expression, whatever you want to call it, has its own very well-documented benefits. Research has found that singing, drumming, journaling, making crafts, can strengthen social bonds, lower blood pressure, improve cognitive functioning, uh, improve problem-solving ability. But more recently, we're figuring out that the reason that creative practice has all of these benefits, in addition to like the neuroscience and the physiological responses, what it's really all about is that it puts in, us in touch with our shared humanity. And that, is very often felt as a spiritual experience. So now, what is creativity? It's what, something only talented people have access to? Yeah. Though that is pervasive. Uh, I, in fact, did my own very tiny, total non Brene Brown like uh, survey of about 100 people earlier this year, and I found out that 99% of the people who responded, it was like 100 people, uh, did some kind of creative thing, however they defined creativity, at least twice a month. But only about 75% of them thought of themselves as creative. So what is creative can go well beyond the traditional arts. And it's not limited to the prodigies and the celebrities and the award winners, right? It's not the Guggenheim Fellows and the like, people who are in museums. It's all of us. All of us have access to creativity because all of us have access to this spirit, breath, prana, chi thing. Creativity shows up in teaching, training for a personal best in a 10K, throwing the most beautiful curveball. It can be leadership. It can be service as a therapist or a pastor or even just a friend in the act of witnessing another as they walk through a dark time. But what elevates these acts from simple tasks or pastimes or even jobs 
into creativity, that place where you find transformation and awe and resilience. And where resilience is not only possible, but inevitable, we find them in four very specific characteristics of practice. And this is where we figure out what exactly this thing is called practice. It's repetition, right? That thing that you just do over and over again, that's practice. It gets boring. Then it's like, feels like pulling teeth. You know, maybe you have a, a kid who's taking violin lessons and they hate to practice, so you have to set up a chart and like give them a gold star every time they can practice for 15 minutes. It's perfectionism. It's getting it right and then beating yourself up when you make a mistake. That is not what practice is, my friends. Traditional arts of all kinds, visual, musical, movement arts, give us some of the best examples of creativity and practice at its best. We admire artists most for their ability to create things of amazing beauty and grace with a level of skill and mastery that only comes with practice, repetition. When artists practice, we are not practicing a part or a technique. We're not relentlessly driving toward perfection. We are just practicing these four very important characteristics. Humility, curiosity, presence, and consistency of purpose. When you practice, practice anything, with these four qualities, you start to let your practice, to let your life, to let whatever the thing is that you're connecting with, something bigger than you. You let it shape you into a more refined version of yourself. It's like you're making yourself that block of marble that gets chipped away and shaped into a masterpiece. I believe that one of the best examples of the kind of practice and creativity that I'm talking about can best be found in the 1984 or 2010, depending on your generation, film, The Karate Kid. Does everybody know The Karate Kid? Show hands, 1984 Karate Kid. Yeah. I had a poster of Ralph Macchio on my wall. 2010 Karate Kid. I love the 2010 Karate Kid so much because it's got Jackie Chan and it's great. Um, and there are so many, like, the whole arc of the film is just a brilliant example of exactly what I'm talking about. So uh, please, when you go home today, get yourself in some air conditioning, some Hulu, and watch the 2010 Karate Kid at any rate. Uh, so synopsis for those of you who need a refresher or have never seen it. Uh, new kid in town, Daniel, Dre in the new version, uh, is having a hard time. He's being bullied at school. Uh, he meets up with Mr. Miyagi, uh, who is an unassuming mechanic or maintenance person um, who has, you know, displays this magical, almost magical ability in kung fu or karate, depending on the version you're watching. <laughs> um, and so he hooks up with Mr. Miyagi and he says, please teach me karate. I need to know karate so I can beat up the bad guy, right? And he goes in expecting to learn karate. You know, he's like expecting to learn moves and here's how you fight and whatever. Instead, Mr. Miyagi puts him to work. You know, like sanding floors, painting the garage. Waxing his car. Wax on, wax off is the instruction. And Daniel's like, that's it? Yeah, 
That's it. And through this ingenious and somewhat dramatic strategy, Mr. Miyagi is teaching Daniel attention, humility, curiosity. All the way through, Mr. Miyagi keeps reminding Daniel that the art of karate is about creating peace, not making war. Wax on, wax off. Keep doing what you're doing. Use your skill in service of others. Stay curious, even when what you think you're doing is completely mundane and menial. Stay present, because the devil is in the details. Maintain a consistency of purpose so that everything you do is in service of something greater. Be diligent. Be mindful. Be curious. Humble. Repeat. When we're in the midst of practice, you know, we can say, oh no, I messed up. Oh. No, you don't have to like, contract like that. We can say, what happened there? Huh, why did I do that? Could I do that again? What if I did it this other way? What happens if we try this? And all of a sudden, you're not contracting and living as under some resistance, but you're growing. Staying at all times inside the boundaries of what we can control. Because as soon as you say, oh man, I messed that up. I'm going to lose that audition. What are they going to think? I'm never going to get this right. You have left the boundaries of what you can control. You've left curiosity. You've left attention. You've left humility. What do you do? You go back to your breathing. You can control that. The shape of your hands as you hold your instrument, you can control that. What you choose to believe, what you choose to focus on, you can control that. And as we ask questions in this way of ourselves, we go deeper and deeper into a place inside ourselves that loves ourselves. And it's this wellspring from which we draw courage and resilience. Practice takes courage. So that when we go out into life and we bump up against things that feel like they're against us, when it's time to align with those things in the world that stand for love and for good, and when the governing powers label you the resistance, you have the resilience and the heart and the self-belief to just keep being. Just keep doing what you're doing. Because what you are is a unique and essential ingredient of this whole universe. And you are as magnificent and precious as each star in the sky and every leaf on every tree. And that's all resilience is. It's what happens naturally when we keep practicing the very best, the art of being. In essence, when we engage in creative practice, we are returning to our essential nature as humans. In Walt Whitman's A Song of Myself, we might see a character who's a bit of a slacker. He's like, I love, I'm at my ease. Not maybe what comes to mind when you think of a great and prolific writer. But look again 
And the person announcing himself to the world looks a lot like that blade of grass that he's communing with. It's grass. Its job is to grass. It just grows. It'll grow through cracks in the pavement. It'll sprout off a windowsill six stories high if a seed blows up there. And when we are aligned with love and life, resistance then is not something that we do. It's something that we encounter as we grow in our resilience. When we are practicing being aware that our small daily effort is connecting us to something bigger than us and to one another, we develop resilience. And we develop an ability to authentically self-advocate because we know it's not just us doing this. It's all of us. Every atom belonging to me as good belongs to you, says Whitman. And each of our efforts pull us all toward a giant web with the tensile strength to move through any perceived obstacle. And when enough of us are practicing the high art of love, we start to grow through, to outgrow, really, the structures that are now in place. We're like plants sprouting through pavement on rooftops, along walls. And over time, the structure through which we are growing becomes transformed. Now, I don't want to make this sound easy. It is not easy. There are definitely those opposing forces that can bring us down from time to time. They live inside us and they live outside of us. They go by many names too. Greed, envy, resentment, fear. I try, but they're making it impossible. We must stand against our enemy rather than for the good. The bad guy is over there. I can't do this anymore. Nobody cares. Nothing's ever going to change. Who, what does it matter what I have to say? I'll never get this right. Practice, creative practice, is where we unpick all those knots. Resistance is always something we encounter. It is not something we do. When you commit yourself to a creative practice, you will encounter this resistance every day. There are constant roadblocks. You will lose as much as you win. The karate kid does not just wax on and wax off and all of a sudden he's a black belt. He has to wax on and wax off for weeks and then test his skills. But it's the spiritual practice, the spiritual component of it, that makes the difference between building resilience and letting resistance wear you down. With presence, curiosity, humility, and consistency of purpose, a dull blade is sharpened into a formidable tool. So, what can we do today to start practicing our own creativity? First, find what lights you up. It doesn't matter what it is. Maybe you have always wanted to paint, or take a dance class, or join a kickball league, or, I don't know, make a movie. Find what lights you up. You're probably doing something creative already. Cooking. Gardening, the everyday practice of getting your kids to school, the art of work. And then, practice the art of practice. There are Miyagi's everywhere to guide you if you are open. For example, I was watching So You Think You Can Dance last week? We fans? Am I the only one? Love it. And one of the judges, Lorianne Gibson, she's a choreographer who like defined pop dance 
stuff. Like she choreographs Beyonce and Michael Jackson did, um, like Alicia Keys and Lady Gaga. She's like everywhere. And she said this, make the choice to believe in yourself and to let yourself fall in love with the spirit that brought you here to this thing you love. Do that. Uh, I have a, a friend, Todd Baxter, he's a fine art photographer, who I interviewed for a story a few years ago, and he said these very wise words that will carry you very far in any creative practice, don't be afraid to suck. <laughs> And I implore you, go back and watch The Karate Kid, especially the 2010 version. Um, that's where uh, Miyagi turns into Mr. Han, who's played by Jackie Chan, and he's just like a font of gems of wisdom. Like this, he says, Kung Fu lives in everything we do. You have seen how we put on a jacket how we take off the jacket. And in that, you've seen how we treat people. Everything is Kung Fu. And so, whatever art you practice, make it your prayer. Closing words are from William Faulkner. Never be afraid to raise your voice for honesty and truth and compassion against injustice, lying, and greed. If people all over the world would do this, it would change the earth.